It needs a name. Willard Gate. Willard Gate fits. Let me tell you why. In the context of Steve Bannon having been indicted now for two counts of contempt to Congress, all eyes and attention need to be on what transpired at the Willard Hotel the night before the attempted insurrection on January the 6th. Hence my name, Willard Gate. These events were much more complicated, much more sophisticated, a better word, than many of us, certainly yours truly, initially believed. Because Donald Trump approached every day of his presidency as yet another episode of his reality program, I think that's what he told Michael Wolff for Fire and Fury, um, during the course of his four years, everything was seat of the pants, right? There was no cohesive planning. And maybe that shouldn't be a surprise because after all, this was a candidate who was nominated in a convention that didn't even put forth a conventional platform. I mean, everything about the Trump administration was to be George Costanza, the opposite of that which we were accustomed to. From the moment that he was inaugurated until he departed from the South Lawn and bypassed the opportunity to participate in the inauguration of his successor. But the attempt at overturning the election was not as free-flowing as his administration had become accustomed to. And here's what I'm talking about. We now know that Donald Trump was at Mar-a-Lago getting ready to celebrate, you know, his traditional New Year's party, 2020 going into 2021, having lost the election. There were moves afoot in Arizona and Georgia and Pennsylvania and Michigan to challenge the election result for sure. But now he's contacted in Florida by Steve Bannon, who says, hey, we've got a shot at this thing. You need to, you need to get back here and lend support to our effort to overturn the election. Efforts that would culminate in a meeting at the Willard Hotel on the night of January the 5th. What did those elements consist of? What was the move afoot? Well, we now know from John Carl's book that there was the Jenna Ellis memo. This, this is a memo intended to provide legal justification for Mike Pence that there was a constitutional basis for him to not accept the outcome of the Electoral College vote. In similar fashion, and we learned this from uh, Bob Woodward and Robert Costa in their book, Peril, there was the John Eastman, the John Eastman memo. And similarly, there was an effort by Trump to lean on the Justice Department to embrace the recount effort that was taking place with regard to Georgia. The memo never transpired. The memo was never forthcoming from justice, but I bring it up because it's indicative of the level of planning and sophistication that was going on behind the scene. Um, in addition to these legal efforts, what was transpiring was the recount in the field. Those states that I referenced, Arizona, Michigan, Pennsylvania, and Georgia, there was also all of this pressure being brought to bear on Pence. Because the idea was that Pence would be convinced by all of the legal justification that he really had an option other than just being a bean counter when the Electoral College vote was presented on January the 6th. And what was he supposed to do? He was supposed to accept challenges from a combination of those states that were being challenged so that neither Trump nor Biden got to 270, then it's thrown to the House of Representatives, and in the House of Representatives, the vote would be one per delegation, not a simple majority based on the 435 members. Republicans had a 26-24 edge, so if every state voted along party lines, Donald Trump is reelected as President of the United States. The one question mark that I have, and this is why I'm so interested to see what the outcome is of the January 6th select committee vis-a-vis -vis Meadows and Bannon and Giuliani and others, especially those around Trump, is what was the message communicated to the foot soldiers?
The Washington Post had reporting last week that said about 600 people have been charged so far who were at the Capitol on the day of this attempt at insurrection. And their point was to say that, you know, it was a cross-section. These are not people generally with rap sheets. You had, a yoga, you had yoga instructors and school teachers and small business people, but you also had a smaller element of proud boy types who came dressed, came armed, came intending to do bad things. What I most want to know about the meeting that took place with Steve Bannon and others at the Willard Hotel on the night of January 5th, the night before the events that would then unfold, is how did they communicate what they wanted to be done at the Capitol the following day? There was too much going on to leave to chance what these people who were showing up were supposed to do once they got to the Capitol. And that's why I think all effort in this investigation is now going to shift to a suite at the Willard Hotel the night before, where apparently Mark Meadows was a participant, and when he leaves, Donald Trump calls in to speak to either Bannon or Giuliani or some combination of both. Roger Stone apparently made an appearance at the hotel that day as well. What went on at the Willard Hotel to send a message to the foot soldiers of January 6th as to what they were supposed to do. That's what I want to know. And my hunch is that when we get to the bottom of it, we're going to find out that the command center, the war room that Bannon ran at the Willard Hotel, is pivotal and critical to our understanding of what transpired on January 5th and 6th.